So uh, this is your opportunity to uh, kick off the discussion. Uh, it's not a panel discussion as such. It is, we've only got 15 minutes, so it's really a chance to ask the questions that have been um, uh, occurring to you during the morning. So who would like to kick off? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Gareth Jones. I'm a, a respiratory consultant at the Royal and I help with the Cure Inpatient Smoking Cessation Programme as well as Helping Cancer Alliance. I, I, just, I guess for the panel generally, <clears throat> is there a risk that the new legislation will perversely disincentivise engagement in this topic? Because smoking sorted now in the future, isn't it? Um, it's all going to finish, the next generation <laughs> are going to quit. But how, how do we keep momentum um, in smoking cessation and engagement with it because if it's kind of everyone's job it's nobody's really isn't it and that's my question thank you very much indeed good question so who'd like to go um, if you don't mind I'll go first just because I remember being told that in 2007 my friends and family said well you can give up and go home now can't you and it wasn't true then and it's not true now I think what helps is um, that the uh, Chief Medical Officer in particular is very clear that um, the raising the age of sale is going to um, stop the next generation becoming addicted, but that we need to do everything we can to continue to help the 6.4 million smokers in the UK to quit and the extra funding um, for stop smoking services, for the mass media campaigns which will raise awareness. You know, and f it, since well, the last 10 years, we've seen a, a, a total decline in the amount of money spent on that awareness raising. And we know um, that, that young people and young, young adult smokers are really not aware of the risks. That's going to change. So it will enhance that understanding. And the Swap to Stop campaign, you know, all these things are actually going to make a difference. So I'm, I'm optimistic, but you're absolutely right about the dangers. And I, and I was just going to say, I absolutely think we need to be shining a light on the fantastic work our NHS colleagues are doing in the tobacco dependency treatment services and the importance of the NHS long-term plan, but we can't assume that they're, gonna, they're all going to be clinically mainstreamed. And I think the more that you can share, Gareth, the fantastic work I'm assuming, I'm sure is happening in your trust, it's really, really important because the NHS does have a vital role to play. So, well done. Thank you. Coming from you. Thank you, Gareth. So um, my comment was really about we have quite quite some fragile treating tobacco dependency programs in the NHS, and I think there's a it took we took us a little bit of a longer than we anticipated to get that up and running in Cheshire and Merseyside, truth be told. So I'm a little bit anxious about people thinking oh, that's that that'll dis disaffirmate or go away, and we'll have to pick that up again. This programme is about trying to join some of that up because of the, the new thing or the new kid on the block is the fact there is investment going into the community services. Um, one of the things we did with the sector-led improvement was bringing together the commissioners, the providers together, saying, look, we all want the same outcomes here. We don't want you to be in competition for four-week quits or trade-offs. You know, it's, it's about real people going over different geographical uh, boundaries. How do we bolster that together? So I think there's a bit of a different model that we need to look at. Um, but it's really important, especially when we get that's funded regionally and nationally. Um, I know you're sitting right next to me, Michelle, but that's, uh, that is a challenge. We need to make sure that, that investment continues into those programmes, I think. So it's a good question for us to keep focused on. Um, hi, yes, I'm Sinead Clark. I'm an Associate Medical Director of the ICB and I'm a GP. Um, and I think the thing that struck me, um, well, lots of things struck me this morning, but the thing that struck me was around the vaping, that actually a lot of smokers think vaping is as bad for them as smoking that definitely chimes with what my patients are telling me all the time and it doesn't seem to matter what I say to them they don't believe me um so how do I you know um and so my question is how do you think we get the balance between and I've also got a teenage child and every single one of his friends and I'm sure him has, has tried vaping um so you know how do we get the right balance between trying to stop people taking up vaping who don't smoke but getting smokers to understand it's vastly safer um, and can really help them quit. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Who'd like to kick off with that one? <laughs> um, I mean, I'll kick off. I, absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more that there is a, a tough call, and I think some of it might be learning as we go a little bit. I think, you know, vapes are quite new. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 the introduction of the powers, 
um, we might have to kind of look at how that is working um, because you, you're absolutely right everything that we hear as well is that I think we've either it, the messages aren't getting through or we've almost overshot because of the focus on children which is a really important um, focus but we're almost kind of dis dis disinvest um, disincentivizing our, our smokers where you know we really do need to, to focus on that I think also you know some of that insight work that, that we talked about that we can do collectively may may help with some of that um, but I do think you know there, there is work to do there and and you know some of it might be kind of learning as we go along and learning from other other places as well thank you I think it's about as well how we interact with our communities and having distinct messages going to distinct places so that the people that are smoking probably won't be picking up in the messages in the same places that children so maybe using schools and um, other other such things so I think we can we can do the two um, but I can see the challenges there where maybe you've got a parent who smokes and a child comes and says oh vaping's awful I'm never going to be doing that and then the the, the smoker is thinking oh, well I want to start vaping so I can give up smoking so I think we'll have to be fleet of foot but we really, really targeted in in our communities about where those messages go. Um, Ash started monitoring youth use in 2013 because once vaping started taking off amongst adults in 2010 it was obvious that um, it was likely to become a problem and it was our early data that sort of highlighted the growth. So we've always been concerned about it but actually what we see is that during the time when youth vaping went up so did per perceptions of risk because let's be honest teenagers and young adults are not risk averse it's older smokers who are risk averse and who also are so addicted that they're looking for excuses to carry on smoking. So that's why our focus is on getting the tobacco and vapes bill passed so that with the vaping measures there, we can get rid of the bright colored packaging, the, the cartoon characters, the names like Unicorn Shake, all of that sort of stuff. We know from tobacco that those sorts of regulations, the plain packs, the, the, the control of displays, all of that will make a difference with youth, whereas risk perceptions aren't necessarily, whereas what they are doing is they're going in such a bad direction that they are worrying adult smokers. So I think that's that's my message and I think we do need to do more on, on um, in schools and we've been working with Sheffield City Council in particular developing materials. But we've got to tell children the truth and, and the sort of thing you see in the media is, is just completely inaccurate. And you know, I think that's another important thing is we've got to tell children what the evidence shows, um, not the sort of hysterical coverage that's being given because it's not actually stopping children from experimenting, um, but it is stopping adults who otherwise might use vaping to quit. Thank you. And, and just to, to reinforce that in terms of the evidence base, I think it's pretty clear on vaping now. And we're very fortunate that OHID PHE previously has you know, commissioned a number of hugely systematic evidence reviews and quite often I think some of the questions I'm asked in forums would be answered if people did go back and, and look at that and, you know, there's been a huge amount of research in that respect. I think for me as well is 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 if we are going to be, we, it's very important that we, we advocate for clear policy measures to reduce the appeal to young people but I also think it's important that we're robust in terms of data a number of times I've been told all young people are vaping the data does not stack up for that and I think we all have a responsibility of knowing what the data actually tells us so if you are in a local authority and you are doing a, a school behavior survey I, I would really strongly advocate that you have consistent messages use the same messages and questions that Ash do in there so we can compare apples with apples is that you know there's a lot of confusion out there and I do think that the more in the public domain there is a sense of all young people are vaping as a youth what is that take-home message and just lastly wearing my balance hat um alcohol is a known class one carcinogen the alcohol industry are directly targeting marketing gorgeous packaging to young people but I haven't seen the same level of concern around that and I do think it's really important that we view you know, in the ideal world, r young people wouldn't risk take on anything, would they? But we're not living in the ideal world. <laughs> um, so I, I, I do worry sometimes this is this takes away from some of the really important areas. And I'm not at all dismissing youth vaping as an issue, but there's nothing more heartbreaking to me than a smoker saying 
certainly not this GP here, but oh, the doctor told me uh, you never, you don't know what's in it, so they stay smoking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Kate Pike. I'm the lead for tobacco for Trading Standards Northwest, but I'm also the lead officer for tobacco and vaping for the Chartered Trading Standards Institute. And this is a question I think probably f for you, Michelle. Um, Rebecca said it would be really helpful for us to, um, uh, you know, comment on the tobacco and vapes bill and help it get through uh, get through the, the committee stage, which obviously we will do. Um, it was really interesting, um, the second reading last week, how many speakers said, oh, but it can't be enforced. It can't be enforced. Uh, speakers who, who don't enforce when the actual enforcement body is incredibly supportive of the change in age of sale. You know, it, more than 80% of our members support the change in age of sale in the smoke free generation bill, and we're the people who enforce. So it, it's really important that we get that message over. Um, and Rebecca mentioned there'd already been an amendment to change to a one-off increase. Do we respond to amendments or to the bill? What, how, what's the best way of putting those points over? Deborah might, might know as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure I will be able to answer all of that. Um, so as Rebecca said, the next stage is the committee um, stage. And there'll be um, a smaller group that will review the amendments and she did say as well that everything will be published. Um, I don't know, Deborah, if, um, if you know any more about... Yeah. Um, um, thanks very much. Yeah, the bill committee uh, is currently being constructed. There will be 17 members. It's due to be announced um, Wednesday evening, I think, um, and there will be um, 10 from the government and seven um, opposition, four of whom will be Labour, uh, and three other parties. But um, And the first two hearings, the Bill Committee starts its sitting on the 30th and carries on till the 23rd, and any evidence needs to be submitted to the committee um, between those dates, well, b between now and, and, and the 23rd of May, but the sooner the better, and it would be good to have a regional um, approach. And also, if one of the, 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 the MPs happens to be in your region, you should get in touch with them and go and talk to them. That's certainly completely appropriate. And the first two hearings are oral evidence on the 30th and first of, 30th of April and 1st of May. I'll be giving evidence, Ailsa will, Kate, I know you will too. And we can address... Um, not just the bill, but also how the bill relates to other legislation going through, for example, the DEFRA ban on disposables or the um, vaping tax uh, currently being consulted on. We can address um, amendments that are being made and why, you know, for example, we would support the government's proposal as opposed to just limiting it to 21, which is very much a tobacco industry preference. Um, you know, all those things can be addressed, but, um, and what will happen is they will hear the oral evidence and then their next sessions between then and the 23rd of May will be addressing the bill line by line and discussing amendments and discussing, you know, any loopholes in the, the legislation, for example, and, you know, the Chartered Trading Standards Institute and UK are ideally placed to point those sorts of things out um, in order that the bill can then... Uh, the government can take on board all of those comments and will then either accept or not amendments and amendments can then be relayed. They won't be voted on in committee stage. They will be voted on at what's called report and third reading, uh, which is likely to happen in early um, uh, to mid-June after the Whitson recess. And... Um, uh, after it's gone through the Commons, it will then go to the Lords. Now, that's really important because if a bill isn't passed before the election is called, it, the government will have the, the next government will have to start from scratch again. But there is something called wash up, which when the government announces it's going to dissolve Parliament for the election, there's a period of about a week when the government and the opposition discuss priorities. Now, this is clearly a priority because. Um, the Prime Minister's behind it, but so is um, the Labour opposition. And as long as it's reached the Lords, we have every hope it will get through what's called wash-up and a final version of the bill will then be passed. And so an incoming government will then go to the next stage, which is to implement 
the legislation that's on what's called the face of the bill, which is raising the age of sale one year every year, um, and various other bits and pieces on enforcement, but also developing the regulations, which are particularly important for the vaping side of the bill, as um, Becca discussed earlier. That's a very rapid run through, and if anyone's got any more questions, let me know, and I don't know. Yeah, Rose, um, thank you, because I couldn't have answered that. <laughs> um, but just to say, um, so a lot of the, um, the amendments that come through, they're not surprises to our policy leads. So there's a lot of work that's gone on behind the scenes, versions, challenges, edits, even to get it to this stage. And I think yeah. that's really important to know. And as be has been yeah. said a few times today, there's still so much opportunity for everybody in the room to really get behind even some of the smaller detail and being very clear with your MPs about which bits you feel still need um, strengthening or you know like our, our backing um, because of the potential challenges so there's still plenty of time for lots of um, changes but again lots of influence too. And I think what I'd like to add is um, Cheshire Merseyside will be signing up to Altogether Smoke Free. So that's all the partners who sit around the ICB, which in includes local government. And I think it's really important that trading standards or enforcement teams work hand in glove mm -hmm. with public health. They don't work in silos. And absolutely, as you've just said, they will want to see this enforced. Um, yeah. And I think that's a really powerful message because sometimes national government, they don't understand how local government works. <laughs> uh, so um, I think it's a really powerful message and yeah. it's certainly something I can do through the, the LGA that we will work hand in glove together to, to make sure this happens. Thank you. And it's great that the police are here as well and we know HMRC are absolutely key in this. There's a real partnership around illicit uh, tobacco as well to uh, to. Uh, to support as well. Sorry, um, I'm Kim Williams. I'm here on behalf of the Beyond Children's Transformation Programme. And I am going to bring it a little bit back to children again, just to say a couple of things. Um, I think it's it's really great to see in this strategy that uh, there's, there's work to be done with children. I think a lot of your legislation about making it harder for people to buy all the advertising, that it will go a long way. I think we underestimate sometimes the power of children. So actually, if we do give them more information and put it robustly into their PHSE, I always get that wrong, it might be PSHE, um, then they're really useful influence of their parents. If you told children that their parents might die 10 years early or those sorts of messages, I think they help influencing at that level. Another uh, couple of things, I really like the chronic relapsing long-term condition using smoking as that. I think sometimes if we reframe the narrative, that's a useful way for people to work with, with people. And then just one thing that um, at the moment is on my radar is the inequality in the inpatient offer. So the inpatient offer is just for adults. It's not for children. So, And it's being done in Blackpool, so for children over the age of 12. So I think if they can do it in Blackpool, we could do it in Cheshire and Merseyside, and that would you know we all of our all of those presentations said that people started smoking when they were 11 so i think you you know our stories say that that's when it's starting so i think that's when we should start addressing it thanks thank you very much and who would like to comment ian I'll take, thank you Ruth. Um, so thank you and it's good to draw that attention so beyond is for people who are not too familiar with it is hosted by our colleagues at Alder Hay, but are uh, very much focused the multi-agency programme for improving the outcomes of children and young people in Cheshire and Merseyside. And one of the programmes that you work on is that some of the, uh, the in, in the schools work as well, isn't it? The Brief Easy programmes, awareness raising about vaping and how can we scale some of that up, which is really important. And um, so, so we're not, haven't been on a stand and start on, on some of that. Um, also really grateful um, to Andrew because we've engaged with our young people as part of uh, the work that the directors of public health have done to get that voice in um, when they've been advocating for the bill and I think they went down together and um, to help, they yeah. did didn't they so yeah. the more we can do about that the great um, we also have Raj here chair of the ICB but also chair of our children yeah. young people's committee so I think there's some quite nice synergies between the healthcare partnership the work of beyond and this agenda really so Thank you for the suggestions and 
hopefully you can see we're going to try and weave that in more the more we can do on it and um, i probably should say like my own feeling is we don't engage as much as what we should do with our educational leaders yeah. and the head teachers in that just remember as previously as a dph our head teachers were very much saying there's a real challenge in some of their secondary schools how they go about it the support that we can provide a distraction away from the educational purposes of being there so how could we use our uh, leads around that to for the same common gain gain cheers thank you very much i'm conscious that uh, we do need to move on to uh, table discussions so could you please uh, join me in thanking the, uh, the, the panel of uh, speakers thank you um, could I ask that